you might need a block TPL to start adding some classes around the block or, or take some markup away. You might need a views TPL. You might need a views row TPL, node, um, fields. And it gets, yeah, pretty repetitive if you want to make that many markup changes. Usually we just say, screw it and leave the divs because it's faster. And the client doesn't look at the, well, sometimes they do and they don't like it. Um, wouldn't it be nice if, whoa, wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, write lean markup and CSS that actually reflected display rather than just a bunch of Drupal, Drupal logic? Um, and you know, maybe use some more semantic HTML5 cla uh, uh, elements. I don't know. Just have, oh, there we go. Nice. Um, just have some markup that's cleaner, you know? And then kind of put our data in later and not necessarily base it around what template file we're using or, um, yeah, or maybe even in the future uh, when like web components come out, you could have more semantic classes, your own custom classes. Say, you know, you wanted to put a recipe, you could just say recipe. It makes a lot more sense than article or div or whatever element we're forced to use now. Um, you can kind of do that stuff now, kind of, <laughs> but um, Angular kind of gives us a way for us to, whoa, that's cool, that's my slides, this is cool, reveal JS, it kind of lets you have all your stuff here, anyway, I don't need my notes. <laughs> Yeah, Angular basically lets you kind of do some of this stuff now. If you want to go and create some of this um, lean markup and stuff, um, Angular is just basically a file that you include in your in your um, in your project. It's a it's a JavaScript library, a JavaScript framework um, that will let you do some some. I mean, it, it's like an application. It, 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 it's kind of like a, a um, let's use kind of extends HTML. Let's use uh, new tags and stuff to do kind of application logic and stuff. But we're not gonna we're not gonna look at at um, a lot of that. What we're gonna do is look at some of the the ability for it to to take data and put it into a template on the client side. Um, so. We can't just take data from Drupal um, as it is. Like we can't go to some node page or some Drupal theme and take data and um, and with it with it already being marked up with tags around it and just put it into a site. We need we need raw data. Angular doesn't really like um, you know decorated data. So how do we get raw data out of Drupal? Um, that's where like, web services come in. Now, when I first heard of web services a couple years ago, uh, services mod module, Drupal 7, um, yeah, with app developers, phone app developers, I didn't really think I would ever use it as a themer. Um, but um, you can, what is a web service? I and mean, we can get into some long definitions, but basically a web service is a URL that you expose on your website and you expose some raw data or an endpoint you can think of and you go to it and there's no there's no markup or anything all there is is some data that's output um, what about rest so web services in rest rest you could go to um, this link it's Roy Fielding uh, dissertation on rest you could read that and get really confused like I did or you can just uh, think of rest as an architectural pattern I had a philosophy but I showed somebody in the slides and he said no, it's an architectural pattern okay um, that's the kind of conversations that happen around rest people are still arguing this is restful this isn't restful um, yeah it's basically a philosophy dictating or architectural pattern uh, suggesting ways that we can better interact with those endpoints, that data that's being exposed via web, web, uh, web services. 
There's a link here uh, to Lynn Clark and Clausey's presentation from uh, DrupalCon Prague in Europe. And they do a really good job talking, uh, extending on, on what a little bit what I'm going to be talking about of how to get data out of Drupal using REST in Drupal 8. Um, this is a Drupal 7 distribution called We the People. It, this is the kind of, this kind of got me, gave me my first, I had to do a presentation at DrupalGov um, in Australia. That's where I'm from, by the way. That's where my company's from. Um, and I did it on We the People. I downloaded the petitions distribution, and they have an API, like, out of the box. I was amazed. You download it, and you have all these endpoints and stuff that you can access um, some, some, petitions and, and some Drupal information. Um, Drupal 8 has an API out of the box as well. So you install some of these modules um, or enable some of these modules already in core. Uh, and, and that's these four up here. And yeah, you have an API out of the box. Uh, we could go into, if you go look at that presentation by Lynn Clark, and Klausi, they, they really go into a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm not going to go super into it, but just quickly, HAL is hypertext application language. It, it makes maybe our, our output, our, um, our data that we're outputting via our web services more uh, rich. Uh, HTTP basic authentication just adds some um, authentication around getting that data out so we can start having a permission and different levels of uh, authentication. Uh, yeah, RESTful Web Services adds a kind of a REST framework around uh, exposing that data. And serialization is taking the Drupal data and uh, uh, serializing it, turning it into a format that we can extract. And there's different formats, XML, JSON. And actually, the Drupal data that we, the, the one that Drupal 8 uses, the format um, kind of by default is like HAL plus JSON. So it's a form of JSON called HAL JSON. And we'll use that later, just so you're familiar. Um, don't worry too much if, you're not, if you don't understand. I didn't. Uh, and this REST UI, you need this contrib module. It's a contrib module. You download it and install it in Drupal 8, and like, you can see all the REST stuff. And I'll show you in just a second. And this REST blocks is actually a module that I made. Um, and if I can do it, well, actually, it was, it was actually quite tough. I had to get help. But um, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it towards the end. It's a contrib module. Or a custom module. Uh, yeah, so configuring Drupal 8 uh, REST. How do we get... Well, first off, I don't know if any... You know, Dries' keynote yesterday, he talked about how a lot of the data in Drupal 8 is more structured. Uh, in, Drupal, in Drupal 7, it was a big deal. Like, nodes were entities now, and, and taxonomy terms are kind of entities. But, like, in Drupal 8, this is more so where a lot of this data is extended from an entity class, and it's all kind of done in the same way. Uh, it's all uh, config, there's config entities, and there's content entities, and they're extended in the same way, so it's easier to kind of like um, provide a service that hooks into um, all of these entities in a similar way, and therefore um, exposing these uh, these entities. So if we go down to the REST UI, the one I was talking about, you enable that, and here, here's the REST UI. All of these entities are kind of, you're able, and some of them might look familiar, field, uh, comment, you're able to ex uh, extract all of this stuff out of Drupal, and this is in core by default, um, which is really cool. Um, and you can you know, use that data, and we're going to use it to build a theme, but um, the, the one that's enabled by, it wasn't enabled by default before, but recently I, I reinstalled it, and this is enabled by default now, um, is the node entity. That's like the most common thing in Drupal, you know, the node. Um, and the way you can kind of configure this, you want to turn, like, all right, so there's get, post, delete. These are all actions you can take. For, for our purposes, for theming purposes, right, you know, we're going we're gonna to just use get. Um, we want to get information out of Drupal, you know, to, to kind of, integrate it with our clean markup and what have you. We're going to, and this is by default, it's already enabled, HAL JSON, enable that, and we're going to have, we want to enable cookie authentication. Basically, that just says, um, allows an anonymous, anonymous user to, we read the cookie of anonymous user and, and allow them to access the data. 
So back to, that's coming later, uh, back to um, our slides here. So we configured Drupal 8. We've enabled, it's enabled by default, and Node is enabled by, by default. Um, so how are we going to get this data out, like start seeing some of this data, start seeing some of this data come out of Drupal? Um, this is a really good app. It's called Postman. It's a Chrome, Chrome extension. Uh, and you download it just like any Chrome extension, and it kind of looks like this. So, yeah, I have this Drupal site. It's called, this is local right now. It's got this URL. Um, and we're going to go to node one, and we're going to extract the data. Um, and you say get, oh, you can see, here we go, send. This is why I'm pointing my, my face at the screen so I can see it. Uh, and you get all this data. You can't, if you've ever done a print R or like a DSM and, and Drupal, like you know, this kind of looks like PHP output of data, but it's JSON. And you take these little variables and you, wrap, you can wrap markup around them. It's kind of the gist of it. But in order to get this data out, what you got to do, and this is confusing at first, is you need to ha uh, have an accept header for, for get, for get request. And you want to say format you want to specify which format you want to get this data out. The reason we're doing this, you might say, oh, why, why can't you just get it? The reason you can't do that, because if you go to node one, one, um, yeah, like this is, this is a recipe site, obviously, this is some tacos. Um, and yeah, node one is HTML, CS, or plain text HTML. And if you were to, to get um, that in, in, in Postman, and I, I'm not going to get rid of it now, but if you were to get it, it would just give you HTML down, down here. So we need to uh, specify that we want to get JSON out, or HAL JSON, which provides these links. HAL specifies some of these links here. Okay, let's keep going. So when I did this, I, I, I wanted to do it with different URLs. So I, I, when I get this data out of Drupal, you, you can do it from, if you do it, if you get the data out of Drupal on the current site that you're on, then it doesn't matter. You don't need to um, do anything special. But if you want to get some of this data from a different URL and travel across URLs, you need to uh, do this thing called, and, you know, uh, you have to enable cores. And basically, the gist of it is you, you put this little piece of code on the top of your website or in a module somewhere, and there's actually a, a cores module in Drupal 7, and previous next, um, some of the guys I work with, uh, we kind of just, we made a Drupal 8 version of it, and you just enable it, um, except for PSR4 broke it. Um, you, just, you just enable it, and uh, yeah, and you can now access uh, uh, make requests through separate URLs. So, if, you, if so, what are we going to do here? We have our Drupal 8 server, which is basically this our little recipe site, right? We have a Drupal 8 server, and we have some endpoints. So we've already enabled like Node, an, an endpoint where we can extract nodes out, and we saw through Postman that we can extract that data out, and we, um, we're going to enable, there's another way, if you want to, you can also enable views as well. So we're going to have a, a views endpoint that we're going to enable. And then we're going to have a kind of whole separate um, client side theme. So our theme is not going to be, usually when we have a theme, it's inside of Drupal, right? And it's running through PHP and stuff. But what I want to do is have a client side theme that sits outside of Drupal on a separate URL. That's why we're having cores. Um, we enable cores. And that has, just for, for purposes of demonstrating like the basic tenets of a Drupal theme, we want to have a node detail page. It's really common in Drupal, a Drupal theme. And, and just a home page with like a views listing on it. And the reason I put other, you know, this endpoint foo or whatever, you can have any, it doesn't, you're not limited to one pulling from one data source when you have a client side theme. You can have multiple you know, you could pull from multiple Drupal endpoints and display different data on one page. Okay, so I did that. Um, you can hear next door. Okay, so Angular directives. Now, Angular, 
Angular was built for designers um, in the beginning, but since then it's morphed into more of a, uh, it's a development tool. So it's, it's a little bit complicated. It's pretty complicated. Um, but uh, I'm going to try to explain it in, this, in the scope of this, the basic stuff that we're going to use in, in this session. So um, when you have a client-side theme, the difference is, is you don't, you only need a couple files. You don't need to set up a LAMP stack. You don't need, you don't need MAMP. You don't need to down, even download Drupal. As long as those endpoints are enabled, you can do, start doing some theming uh, with three files or two files, an index, or an HTML file, and you have to include Angular, just, just like you would have to include jQuery or something if you're going to use jQuery. And an app.js, you can do it in a separate file or in the same file. Um, it's just an included file that has some of the logic around what we want our, our client-side theme or our client-side application to do. Um, basically, some of the code here, you, you bootstrap your app. So you tell Angular you want to start up. You bootstrap your app. And then inside of your, so you say you, you bootstrap your app by using these, what's called directives. And that's these, um, uh, these tags or attributes that get attached to, to HTML. And you can just, uh, you could just, um, yeah, you bootstrap your app and you can have, uh, then you can start using Angular stuff inside of wherever you bootstrapped. It's usually bootstrapped on the HTML, so you can start using Angular stuff inside. And now your HTML inside is extended. Um, you then, so Angular provides these, these directives, which basically do stuff, right? It, like, they point to JavaScript functions that do cool stuff around your site. So in this instance, ng, sh ng click, ng show, if you use jQuery, it's pretty simple, a similar sort of thing where it's a click function and a show function. The difference is, the difference, difference, difference is, is that you're doing it, uh, you're declaring it inside of your actual uh, HTML rather than doing it pointing to HTML that's in a separate file. And it kind of makes more sense. Um, yeah, so in this instance, um, we're just, we're just, we're just uh, showing a form or, 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 or removing, a, uh, hiding a form. And I have these, these plunkers. I don't, I don't, it's kind of like a JS fiddle or something. And through this whole presentation, because I realize I probably am not going to, it's really hard to explain code and, and words, I have these plunkers set up to kind of save me, um, where I've done little examples of, and luckily the internet works, <laughs> little examples of, of all the little things I'm going to show. So that's, we were able to just like do a hide show sort of thing. But like I said, we're not going to focus on some of this functional stuff. We're just going to kind of focus on uh, the ability, the, the, the theming, and, and, and kind of how, what we would do in Drupal, how we would theme something in Drupal, right, with template files and stuff. Um, yeah, so where, where Angular has a directive, and it's one of the only directives that deal with kind of putting data into, um, into an HTML file. Um, and that directive is called uh, ng controller. Okay, so basically you ha you have um, a function that lives in your app.js or or whatever JavaScript file, and just like Drupal, it's it's very similar. This this function is very similar to like a preprocess function, where you're putting um, you're putting data or, or you're declaring kind of variables. So you have your recipe.title, and we've said burrito recipe body. Very yum, and it gets attached to this. Don't don't worry about the JavaScript like syntax or anything. If you play with this a while, you'll get it. So I'm just going to explain what it's doing. So it's just like attaching it to scope, which kind of helps us feed our data into our HTML. Then you, with this ng controller, you if you you attach it to a div or any element doesn't have to be a div, and within that div you basically have a template file. Within that div, you have a, you have a, a scoped amount of data that you can, you, can start, you can start using the data that you declared inside of that div. But if you try to use that data outside of the div, it, it won't understand. So basically, this data gets attached to this DOM element, and you can start using it inside and start templating. So if we were to do this, um, so if we were to 
just do this stuff. We would have recipe title, recipe body, and it would print this out. You'd have body, very yum, and italics. You know, just template. And this is all, remember, we're not using PHP. We're not doing this. This is all in JavaScript. Um, so what if we had a file that had some data in it, and we wanted to theme that data, just put LIs around it, right? That's just LIs. And then we have the ID, and then we have the, the, the title. How would we do that kind of with Angular or the cli client-side theme? So we have a local data file that lives in our root directory, right? We need to get that local data file somehow. So what we could do is use a service that's provided by Angular called uh, HTTP. It just basically does an HTTP XML request. Um, it's a wrapper around that. And get, which is a, is a kind of REST action that you can get something. And we're going to get a file, recipes.json. So we, we could say scope.recipes, um, get this file, recipes.json, and it will load it into the recipe scope. And so, yeah, basically it's attaching all that file stuff all that stuff in our file, all those recipes to, a, to this recipe, recipes, which is, um, yeah, which is like just an array of recipes. And uh, yeah, and then we do the same thing we did in our previous example, where we attach a controller, and now we can start using recipes inside of this div. Or if we were to declare in another div, we, inside of that div. Or if we had a different set of data, we could include it onto another, another div. Um, but like this is a this is like a bunch of recipes. You can't just wrap HTML bunch of, uh, around a bunch of recipes. In Drupal's field.tpl, you would it has a loop function in there, and you do that with PHP or in Twig, you can do a similar sort of thing. Um, but Angular has a has, has a directive, and you can kind of start to feel how this is starting to work. Um, that lets you root, loop through the different recipes. So we're going to put the recipe ID dash recipe name. And this is all happening, this is all happening client side. So um, yeah, so you can, um, let's see, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. Yeah, here we go. So yeah, so you can do this on like JS Fiddle. You can do this anywhere. You can do it on Plunker. You can basically do some like live templating you know wrap wrap tags around you know our let's see here this is dangerous to do this stuff but I'm going to do it anyway yeah so yeah that's you can't really see but that's italicized now which is cool it's kind of like css live reload css live templating i mean uh, you know just live live templating i think it's cool um yeah, and you can see all these plunkers. All these links are here. Go through and play with them, and kind of it evolves. So, yeah. So what we did is we used this HTTP service. The main the main thing that you're you're getting here is that we've used this this service to connect to a local file and grab this local file data, and we themed it, right? But Angular wants you to. Uh, Put, create services. So you might, in a, in a typical, typical theme or a typical Angular app, you're going to go out and grab a bunch of data from different places. So you want to organize that data in a certain way, and Angular wants you to do it like this. Um, yeah, so you just declare a service. We're calling it recipe service. Get recipes. And you'll see why we do this later, but we're just abstracting, extracting it a little bit and wrapping this, 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 this get request in the service our own custom service. Then our controller will then call this service um, to fetch the data, basically, and feed it into our template or our HTML file, which is our template. Um, so remember, though, that if we're going to get some data from a Drupal installate or a Drupal website, um, Drupal 8's using HAL JSON, and I showed you with Postman that you had to actually specify a header, HAL JSON. So 
we, you can do this manually in your, your, in your HTTP service, um, but it, it'd be nice if every HTTP, every GET request that we did used the same header, because we know we're going to be uh, connecting to, a, if, if we want to pull data from a Drupal site, we're going to be connecting to a Drupal site. So this is a way you can do that. You can just say, you know, it, it, just follow this sort of function. This is ba this sort of syntax. This is basically how you, how you would do that in the app. This HTTP provider provides the HTTP service, and you're just setting the header across it. And this is just, this is, um, depending on which version of Angular you use, this is like a little gotcha that you may or may not have to include. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much. Let me just see where I'm at time. Okay. Yeah. So here's the cool part, in my opinion. Like getting, so we can get a local file. We can get some data from a local file, but what if we want to get a Drupal node? We want to get information from Drupal. I'll let that load here. We need to go, to, instead of going to our local file, we need to go to our Drupal site, and we need to specify a node ID. So here's where the service comes in handy, because now we can wrap a service around it, and we can specify a node ID as a argument, basically, and, yeah, and fetch our Drupal thing fetch our Drupal data. So, I'm kind of lost here, punk or hell. Okay, so here I set up a Acquia, which wasn't easy. I set up um, Acquia Drupal 8 site, and yeah, so this should work. Um, yeah, so there we go. I have, if you go to this Drupal, it's just a vanilla, Bardic Drupal 8 site, if you go here. Um, and it's basically gone to node 1 and our node, whatever node, I, node 11. And it's loaded up some data into a template. All right. Which is pretty cool. And if you follow that plunker, you can, let me close these so we don't have to uh, deal with them and I don't get lost later. Yeah, and I can't believe I didn't show you this. This is my little little site <laughs> that connects to a Drupal site. And basically, it's doing the same sort, sort of thing. It's going to the Drupal site and, yeah, getting each node. Um, yeah, so routing. This is, this, is, this is cool about these JavaScript uh, MVC frameworks like you think like how do the how do how do you have different URLs on these on these um they say, they're called like single page apps so you think you go and there's just going to be one page but actually if if we're going we have we have different pages so look at the URL the URL is changing and this is all powered by JavaScript. How do, how do we handle this? How do, you, how do you do that in just JavaScript without having a server that renders it? So this is how we do it. There's a little module that you include. So Angular has these little modules that you can include that do different things. One of them is called Angular Route. You um, include Angular Route on your, in your HTML file. And you go to a different, you go to a route, and you click on contact, you click on about, and the data from that route, however the logic might be, will appear just like you can think of page.tpl, like how you have a content variable in page.tpl. The data will appear in this ng view. So you can think of this ng view as content, the content variable in page.tpl. So how do we specify a route? In our app.js, in the place where we put our logic, this is our index, obviously. And look at this. You can use external templates. And then you feed it the controller. And the controller, remember, specifies the data. Um, so yeah, we have contact about us. And each one of these might specify different data sets. You could imagine having um, 
you could imagine having different uh, different UR, different URLs. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter. You could imagine having different URLs. This is local, so it's not going to kill me. Um, based on whatever you specify, contact about us, submit a recipe. Um, arguments. So one of the a key thing that we do in like Drupal theming or Drupal site building is arguments and views, contextual filters. Um, yeah, in Angular, the node is just route params. Pretty, pretty basic. Uh, kind of makes sense. Uh, basically, you specif you could specify a wildcard um, sim in, in our route, similar to like the percentage sign that you might use in tokens or um, in, in Drupal views. Uh, to to kind of do this, so let's let's look at some of this code here. So here's our wild card. Um, when you specify your route, before we're specifying like slash node or or um, about us, but we're going to actually specify a variable here and call it node ID, um, and then we're going to link it up to a template. Let's see if this thing's loaded yet. So yeah, you have you can have these external templates that you can mark up data in. It doesn't you don't have to do it all in one file, and it just goes to that template and, and marks up your data. So we have this node.html, which might template the node in a certain way, just like the node.tpl. Um, and we have our node control, which is going to load the data into this template so we can theme it. And in our controller, for this example, it's just feeding it a node ID. So we can say node 1, node 2. But if we tie all this stuff together, we can create node detail pages. So remember this service we used, the node ID. We can tie it together. Feed, we, in, in Angular, you have to feed in dependencies. I don't want to get caught too much on. You can look at the plunkers and learn how to do this stuff. But um, we have our route params. You feed in your route params. And we can use this service because it accepts a node ID and feed the node ID to the service. And actually, as we hit different URLs or different node 1, node 2, node 3, we um, load in different nodes' data. How am I doing on time here? See what we got here. Cool. So let's let's look at our home page. So on our home page we have a view of of data. And each one of these views links to our node details page. So we've done our node detail page. But now we need to get a view on the home page of this data and then link it off to the node detail page. And this is really cool about like Drupal 8. And Drupal 7 has this stuff too, but it's contrib. Um, this stuff's in core. So views has REST support in core, in Drupal 8. And views is in core, obviously, too. So you go to views. Let's go to a recipe. Yeah, so in this example, I mean, you could render the view as a, as, a, as a rendered entity, and it would kind of come out in that way. But if you want some clean output, you could just render some fields, a title, image, tag, body. And I've, some of this stuff is metadata that I'm using. Um, and you, so, you select, so you could add a REST export, just like you could add a page or add a feed or, or add a block. You add a REST export. And what I've also done is I've also added a page. Because the way I understand it, REST likes to have one resource um, and then use accept headers to go to different ones. So if you go to recipes, slash recipes, because that's what we're using here for our page. This is just basic Drupal. It gives you a, a listing of recipes, right? Um, but if you go to our postman and we go to the same URL, it's outputting 
some data that we can theme that might look familiar, that you can specify and, and just and, and theme it out, wrap tags around it. And we've already done, well, we know how to theme this because we already did it. Remember when we pulled our local, our local um, recipes.json that had a list of recipes? We're doing that same thing here. We've pulled our list of recipes and we just wrapped H2 around it and, and you know, themed it, done what we had to do to theme it. So filtering, sorting, and searching. So this is some of the application style stuff, some of the cool stuff Angular does. And one thing that lets you do is like specify a filter. So in Drupal, um, in Drupal, we might, if we're theming in Drupal, we might like have Ajax views or, or something like that to do some cool on-the-fly sorting. Um, but since in Angular, the data is actually bound to the URL, I mean to the markup, we can do some sorting, and it actually pulls the markup off the page. If I inspect this, um, you can just take my word for it, but if I inspect it, the markup just actually gets pulled rather than, than hidden or you know, ha having it to fire a new request every time. And you can, you can, you can make it fire a new request as well. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool. So, and I'm not going to get into the code that it takes to do that. Um, I have, you can download my, uh, if you're really interested in this, in this particular filter, you can download my repo that I've specified in the beginning. So this is, this is pretty cool too. Um, a custom block. What if you have some data that you want to get out of Drupal that is not specified in the REST UI, or it's not? It hasn't been by default. It's not exportable. You have some custom data. Maybe it's not wrapped in an entity. You want to get some data. You can actually. Um, well, what I've done is I've created my own endpoint by creating a custom module. Um, and let's see here. I'll show you some example here. Is this the right one? Here it is. Whoa. Oh, it's not working. Go. Oh, this is full screen, that's why. Full screen, that's why. Here we go. Oh, come on. Sorry, guys. Here we go. Okay, so that's my reveal.js. Interesting. Sorry. Here we go. So I'm just going to show you the file structure, really. Yeah, so basically created, you know, rest box file, a rest blocks module that kind of extends. It, it, it follows DB log resource. So if you look at DB log resource, I'm like, it, it, it would get too advanced kind of if you're extending classes and stuff. Go look at like functional program. It's crazy for me to get, get this stuff, but I figured it out somehow. If you look at this DB log resource, it's in core. Um, it's in the REST module. You can look on how to extend um, and get your own custom data. But basically what I've done is I've been, created the ability to um, get a block out of Drupal. So if you go into um, our, our Drupal site and you go to... If, I've just linked it up with this feature. Uh, I didn't go and create a new theme. You could create a new theme that mirrors your, your old theme. That, uh, your, your client side theme, but if I were to take this block out of featured because it's linked up and save it, then it should just go away. And if I put it back, oh no, it doesn't. I'm terrible. That's because it's connected to my, um, my internet theme. Cool. Anyway, it goes away, trust me, if you, if you move it out. So you can 
you can create a, a theme that does that. You can create some service that does that. Anyway, so some more stuff around your Drupal client side stuff. Posting, editing, and authentication. So I didn't do, you can do some post stuff, so you can actually post data back. If you look at, uh, um, if you look at Klausi and Lynn Clark's theme, uh, uh, presentation, you can actually post nodes back. So you can have people do ed some editing in your theme and, or your app, and you can post, actually post data back into Drupal. Um, there's some cool Angular, uh, uh, modules that let you do some live editing and stuff. Um, so, I've, I've really talked up this client side theme. I, I don't know if I've, you know, I've, I've seen you can do all this client side theming and stuff. I wouldn't actually use any of this stuff in production. <laughs> uh, this is just so you can get an idea around how you might want to do some of this theming um, on the client side. Uh, if you go to this link here, you can see um, a reason, a company that had a, a very content heavy website. Uh, and they didn't want to use, they, they had listed some reasons why they didn't want to use Angular um, for their content-heavy website. If you have an app, if you're building some sort of JavaScript app, it, it might make more sense. Or if you're building a really simple theme, I'm, I'm going to you know, definitely try to, try to do it, uh, use it. So routing, remember when we were changing all the URLs and stuff. Now I'm not looking at code, I can look at all of you. Um, SEO. Like, how does Google go to the website and, like, crawl these different URLs? In the past, they used what was called, like, hashbang URLs, which was, like, anchors and made them appear in a way that, was, um, that looked like it was going to different pages. But with the HTML5 history API, uh, they were able to kind of make it look like you're going to different URLs by messing with that. Um, Google is now reading some of these URLs. I think Discourse, which is an Ember app, which is similar to uh, Angular, uh, their site is being crawled by Google um, without having to do anything extra. But Google has a whole page on how you might want to implement an SEO strategy. There's also a service called prerender.io, which will like look at your Drupal-free theme. I, that's what I call it for themers, you know, but it's your app, your JavaScript app. Um, and, and kind of make SEO sense out of it. But you could also, what about Google Analytics? I mean, how does Google Analytics know, know which URL people are going to and what have you? And it's kind of funny because Google's behind Angular. You'd think they would have some solutions for that. Uh, learning curves. So there's, you beat some learning curves by not having to install Drupal, not having to, to um, yeah, not having to do, not having to uh, install LAMP and having to do any of all this stuff, but you, there's more learning curves. Obviously, some of that JavaScript, if you're not familiar with JavaScript, might be a little bit too much for people to understand, might be uh, a little bit crazy. I don't know. Um, I'm not a JavaScript guy, as you could probably tell, and I kind of figured it out. Follow those plunkers, and you should be able to, to figure out as far as I got. Um, yeah, the, the, as far as the client side templating is concerned, um, like, yeah, Drupal, all those classes and markup that Drupal puts in there, they put in there for a reason. It's contrib code. People, we have those in there so we can map our, our classes to Drupal logic. And a lot of times it makes sense and it helps us. And a lot of times they put stuff in there for accessibility that maybe if you're not a front end developer, you might not know. And it might be, yeah, you, you might, you might not want to, um, strip all of the Drupal markup out of, out, of, out of your site. And that's what you do. When you do this client-side theme, say goodbye to Twig, say goodbye to all of Drupal's theme layer stuff. You're getting the data out raw, and there's no help there by any... And hopefully, maybe one day, they have some more contrib stuff that helps you deal with some of the Drupal data you might get out of, um, out of a Drupal site. And there's a whole like client-side um, movement as well for, for this sort of stuff, but not now. So thanks, everyone. Um, Twitter, that's my Twitter. Uh, you can get the slides. Uh, there's a client repo if you want to download any of the examples. Sorry I wasn't facing you. I didn't realize that that wouldn't have been a problem. That was going to be a problem. But I'm glad I got to kind of highlight code and stuff and show you. Um, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Any, any, any questions you can come up, or if you want, actually, we probably have time if you want to ask them. 
Yeah, you can go to the, you can go to the microphone. You, you can go. To, or you can, yeah, you, can, you ask me and I'll repeat it. Oops. Or hand it to you. So this guy, um, I don't, I think he's here. Um, Vladimir from Technocrat. He did this in, in Drupal South. He did a session on uh, Bootstrap and stuff. And at the end, he had this Angular site, and I thought it was cool, and that's why I wanted to do it. It wasn't like a business use case or anything, but I'm sure there is around that. Any anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. So that was my use case. Yeah. You, you can yell it out, or I'll repeat, or come over here. So I think their main objection was, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. First time speaker here. Uh, he wanted to know what some of the objections were from uh, the site that wanted to use Angular on, and I'm going to cheat here, uh, on, on what we're using Angular on a content-heavy site. So one thing was SEO, obviously, which they've been getting to solve. This was written a little while ago. And the Twitter previews, like you can't pull in some of the social networking previews, which you can. You can specify meta, metadata and do that. So I don't agree with this. Um, yeah, stats and monitoring, analytics, I kind of address that. Uh, the build tools around front end, I think they're easier to use than the build tools around backend stuff. We're using Thing at work, and I go crazy. Um, yeah, and then testing, which I didn't do. Angular is really big on testing. I didn't do any testing, which is bad. But hopefully, if you're using something like Angular, there's a whole t you're abstracting everything, and we can, as front end developers, maybe can start writing tests. Because I don't write. I mean, I'm I don't write. T does any who writes tests? I mean, sure, there are people who do it really good, but I don't. So. Unfortunately, maybe if I start writing apps and cool themes and stuff, I will. But um, anybody else? Yeah, at the at the mic. Yes, wow, yes sir. That's loud. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. Yes. Um, so my question is, you made a custom module that has a REST endpoint. Yeah, I can show. I can show you that. Yeah, and the question is, how do you make that appear on the list of REST resources? It does it. Stuff? So you extend the cool thing. Like and this is me learning. Like I'm not. I'm a front end developer. But I did it, challenge myself. It, it's, it, all the entities are kind of done in the same way. So the way the serialization and the, and the, re, the rest stuff happens, you can ex extend the entity in, in, a, in a similar sort of way, and it just creates it for you. You specify it in the docs. I can show you the code. It's, it's pretty straightforward. If you look at DB log resource, and that's a guy at work told me to do that, Lee Rollins, who's really, he's a good Drupal contributor, he told me he used uh, DB log resource. Check that out, and you you won't you'll be able to do it for sure. Anyone anyone else? Uh, you answered my question, but I've got a quick comment. Uh, Brian yeah. Hirsch from the White House Web Team. Yep. I maintain the petitions distro that you. Nice. Uh, showed yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned REST, and yeah. you know, for people who are trying to get into stuff and learn REST, uh, Roy Fielding's dissertation on REST is not really easy to read, and um, you know, we have found more and more as we're dealing with these APIs that. You know, RESTful interfaces are just super important for user experience and, and developer experience. So we made a two-pager that's sort of like accessible for project managers and non-technical people on REST. If it's helpful for other folks, uh, github.com slash whitehouse slash API dash standards. I'll put so it in my slides and, and upload it. I actually saw that when I was checking that out. Yeah, cool. Because it's really hard. Like, if you start, say we start building sites like this, it's like, where does a lot, like, how is the data coming out? Like, how is it separated? It's a lot of stuff that back-end developers, hopefully, are going to have to have to think about. And, I mean, but that, that web, that standards he's talking about actually has some good ideas around how to do that. Thank you. All right, so I know you're a, a themer, so you may or may, may not know this one, but I'm wondering how authentication is handled as far as, in this particular example, you know, the user was anonymous, so you just went and grabbed the data, yeah. no, no issues. But what about protected data where only certain roles or permissions, you know, would be able to see these recipes? How do you, on the Angular side, yeah. then, then 
authenticate that person to see the, uh, you know, the data. So there's different levels of, of authentication. You str if, you start, if you try to set this up, you'll struggle with it, and it will force you to learn how to do it, right? Okay. So um, the first step is the cookie authentication, which basically just checks your Drupal cookie similar and, and then lets you pull based on what, what cookie you have. And that's not so very... So does that mean that on the, on the client side, they would have had to... You wouldn't be able to in. see the node on the client side, but if you can see the node then you can kind of access that data. But if you're pulling it from a, from a client-side theme, it, it, it might not make sense. But there's basic authentication, which I think hashes the password or something. And then there's OAuth. Now, OAuth is the way that you know, applications you know, do it. So, okay. But yeah, like I see, I'm a, I'm a themer, so I haven't okay, so delved OAuth in. OAuth is a, is a possibility. In and it's a good, there's a Drupal contrib, there's a good contrib module that makes dealing with OAuth easy. But basically you just select OAuth and then on your client theme you would just put some, uh, some passwords and some keys in. Okay. And then, then when you make the request from the client, nobody else will be able to do it. Gotcha. Okay, but thank you. But I've yet to play. Um, you know, on this topic of uh, not using it for really big sites, it seems like accessibility would be one of the major issues with it mm. too because, you know, the big thing for the responsive community is making sure that, you know, if JavaScript breaks, you should still be able to access the content. Does this kind of wipe all that? It seems like it would. I mean, once the content has been rendered, I mean, you can see, I, I watched, a, I went to JSConf in Melbourne and they had a, a web components and accessibility and accessibility in the shadow DOM and stuff. And the main takeaway I got from that is that, yeah, like, you, that, that stuff will be accessible. Once the HTML has been rendered on the page, you can, there's keyboard accessibility and your markup stays, um, you know, is, is, uh, is um, ac accessible, basically. What, do you have any particular accessibility concerns besides, like, keyboard accessibility or Yeah, screen mostly, readers? like, JavaScript breaking. It's usually not, JavaScript is not turned on. People don't do that anymore. Yeah, uh, there's a big that is not an, ex actually, that's not an, ex I build government sites, and if you look at WCAG, JavaScript not being turned on is no longer, I mean, as far as, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's Well, it's no usually a JavaScript breaks, or the external script breaks. So you need to have testing, I would think, if okay. you're going to be doing a lot of JavaScript heavy stuff, and you want to make sure that your test, have a test, that test if your JavaScript's broken, that way you don't push code that breaks. Okay, cool. That's what I would imagine. Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, is that good? All right. And was me facing the screen really bad, or was it good? Fine? Cool. Uh, you can speaker assessment. <laughs> give me, uh, give me, uh, you know, give me ease, because this is my first time, so. Thank you, appreciate it.